American imperialism is a policy aimed at extending the political, economic, and cultural control of the United States government over areas beyond its boundaries. It can be accomplished in any number of ways, by military conquest, by treaty, by subsidization, by economic penetration through private companies followed by intervention when those interests are threatened, or by regime change. The concept of expanding territorial control was popularized in the 19th century as the doctrine of manifest destiny and was realized through conquests such as the Mexican-American War of 1846, which resulted in the annexation of 525,000 square miles of Mexican territory. While the U.S. government does not refer to itself as an empire, the continuing phenomenon has been acknowledged by mainstream Western writers including Max Boot, Arthur Schlesinger, and Niall Ferguson. Topic imperialism Topic Indian Wars and Manifest Destiny Thomas Jefferson, in the 1790s, awaited the fall of the Spanish Empire until our population can be sufficiently advanced to gain it from them piece by piece. In turn, historian Sidney Lenz notes that the urge for expansion, at the expense of other peoples, goes back to the beginnings of the United States itself. Yale historian Paul Kennedy put it, from the time the first settlers arrived in Virginia from England and started moving westward, this was an imperial nation, a conquering nation, detailing George Washington's description of the early United States as an infant empire, Benjamin Franklin's writing that the prince that acquires new territory, removes the natives to give his own people room, may be properly called father of his nation, and Thomas Jefferson's statement that the United States must be viewed as the nest from which all America, North and South is to be peopled, Noam Chomsky said that the United States is the one country that exists, as far as I know, and ever has, that was founded as an empire explicitly. A national drive for territorial acquisition across the continent was popularized in the 19th century as the ideology of manifest destiny. It came to be realized with the Mexican-American War of 1846, which resulted in the annexation of 525,000 square miles of Mexican territory, stretching up to the Pacific coast. President James Monroe presented his famous doctrine for the Western Hemisphere in 1823. Historians have observed that while the Monroe Doctrine contained a commitment to resist colonialism from Europe, it had some aggressive implications for American policy, since there were no limitations on the U.S.'s own actions mentioned within it. Scholar Jay Sexton notes that the tactics used to implement the doctrine were "...modeled after those employed by British imperialists," in their territorial competition with Spain and France. Eminent historian William Appleman Williams dryly described it as "...imperial anti-colonialism." The Indian wars against the indigenous population began in the British era. Their escalation under the Federal Republic allowed the U.S. to dominate North America and carve out the 48 continental states. This is now understood to be an explicitly colonial process, as the Native American nations were usually recognized as sovereign entities prior to annexation. Their sovereignty was systematically undermined by U.S. state policy usually involving unequal or broken treaties and white settler colonialism. The climax of this process was the California Genocide. Topic. New imperialism and the white man's burden A variety of factors converged during the new imperialism of the late 19th century, when the United States and the other great powers rapidly expanded their overseas territorial possessions. Some of these are explained, or used as examples for the various forms of new imperialism. The prevalence of overt racism, notably John Fiske's conception of Anglo-Saxon racial superiority, and Josiah Strong's call to civilize and Christianize. All manifestations of a growing social Darwinism and racism in some schools of American political thought. Early in his career, as Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Theodore Roosevelt was instrumental in preparing the Navy for the Spanish-American War and was an enthusiastic proponent of testing the U.S. military in battle, at one point stating, I should welcome almost any war, for I think this country needs one. Roosevelt claimed that he rejected imperialism, but he embraced the near-identical doctrine of expansionism. When Rudyard Kipling wrote the imperialist poem, The White Man's Burden, for Roosevelt, the politician told colleagues that it was rather poor poetry, but good sense from the expansion point of view. Roosevelt was so committed to dominating Spain's former colonies that he proclaimed his own corollary to the Monroe Doctrine as justification, although his ambitions extended even further, into the Far East. 
Scholars have documented the resemblance and collaboration between U.S. and British military activities in the Pacific at this time. Industry and trade are two of the most prevalent motivations of imperialism. American intervention in both Latin America and Hawaii resulted in multiple industrial investments, including the popular industry of dole bananas. If the United States was able to annex a territory, in turn they were granted access to the trade and capital of those territories. In 1898, Senator Albert Beveridge proclaimed that an expansion of markets was absolutely necessary. American factories are making more than the American people can use, American soil is producing more than they can consume. Fate has written our policy for us, the trade of the world must and shall be ours. American rule of ceded Spanish territory was not uncontested. The Philippine Revolution had begun in August 1896 against Spain, and after the defeat of Spain in the Battle of Manila Bay, began again in earnest, culminating in the Philippine Declaration of Independence and the establishment of the First Philippine Republic. The Philippine American War ensued, with extensive damage and death, ultimately resulting in the defeat of the Philippine Republic. According to scholars such as Gavin McCormick and E. San Juan, the American counterinsurgency resulted in genocide. The maximum geographical extension of American direct political and military control happened in the aftermath of World War II, in the period after the surrender and occupations of Germany and Austria in May and later Japan and Korea in September 1945 and before the independence of the Philippines in July 1946. Stuart Creighton Miller says that the public's sense of innocence about realpolitik impairs popular recognition of U.S. imperial conduct. The resistance to actively occupying foreign territory has led to policies of exerting influence via other means, including governing other countries via surrogates or puppet regimes, where domestically unpopular governments survive only through U.S. support. The Philippines is sometimes cited as an example. After Philippine independence, the U.S. continued to direct the country through Central Intelligence Agency operatives like Edward Lansdale. As Raymond Bonner and other historians note, Lansdale controlled the career of President Ramon Magsaysay, going so far as to physically beat him when the Philippine leader attempted to reject a speech the CIA had written for him. American agents also drugged sitting President Elpidio Quirino and prepared to assassinate Senator Claro Recto. Prominent Filipino historian Roland G. Cimbalan has called the CIA, U.S. imperialism's clandestine apparatus in the Philippines. The U.S. retained dozens of military bases, including a few major ones. In addition, Philippine independence was qualified by legislation passed by the U.S. Congress. For example, the Bell Trade Act provided a mechanism whereby U.S. import quotas might be established on Philippine articles which are coming, or are likely to come, into substantial competition with like articles the product of the United States. It further required U.S. citizens and corporations be granted equal access to Philippine minerals, forests, and other natural resources. In hearings before the Senate Committee on Finance, Assistant Secretary of State for Economic Affairs William L. Clayton described the law as, "...clearly inconsistent with the basic foreign economic policy of this country," and, "...clearly inconsistent with our promise to grant the Philippines genuine independence." 21st century imperialism The United States has aggressively used its power to expand its influence in recent times, seeking to enter numerous countries militarily, such as Afghanistan and Iraq, building military bases around the world, especially in the Arab countries of the Persian Gulf, deploying its navy in the South China Sea, widely seen as a way to contain Chinese claims in the South China Sea, supporting the overthrow of democratically elected governments such as Venezuela, Iran, and Syria, supporting rebel groups in Libya and Syria, continuing the allegedly illegal occupation of the Guantanamo Bay naval base in Cuba, influencing the complete blockade of countries such as Qatar, using the dominance of the U.S. dollar in worldwide trade to sanction rival countries such as Turkey, Russia, Venezuela and Iran, initiating a trade war with major economic rival China, using protectionist measures against traditional allies and fellow WTO members, Canada, Mexico, and the European Union, and embargoing countries such as Cuba. American exceptionalism 
American exceptionalism is the notion that the United States occupies a special niche among the nations of the world in terms of its national credo, historical evolution, and political and religious institutions and origins. Philosopher Douglas Kellner traces the identification of American exceptionalism as a distinct phenomenon back to 19th-century French observer Alexis de Tocqueville, who concluded by agreeing that the U.S. uniquely, was proceeding along a path to which no limit can be perceived." President Donald Trump has once said that he does not like the term American exceptionalism because he thinks it is insulting the world. He told Tea Party activists in Texas that if you're German, or you're from Japan, or you're from China, you don't want to have people saying that. As a monthly review editorial opines on the phenomenon, in Britain, empire was justified as a benevolent white man's burden. And in the United States, empire does not even exist, we are merely protecting the causes of freedom, democracy and justice worldwide. <laughs> Wilsonian intervention When World War I broke out in Europe, President Woodrow Wilson promised American neutrality throughout the war. This promise was broken when the United States entered the war after the Zimmerman telegram. This was a war for empire to control vast raw materials in Africa and other colonized areas according to the contemporary historian and civil rights leader W.E.B. Du Bois. More recently historian Howard Zinn argues that Wilson entered the war in order to open international markets to surplus U.S. production. He quotes Wilson's own declaration that Concessions obtained by financiers must be safeguarded by ministers of state, even if the sovereignty of unwilling nations be outraged in the process. The doors of the nations which are closed must be battered down. In a memo to Secretary of State Bryan, the president described his aim as an open door to the world. Lloyd Gardner notes that Wilson's original avoidance of world war was not motivated by anti-imperialism, his fear was that white civilization and its domination in the world," were threatened by the great white nations, destroying each other in endless battle, despite President Wilson's official doctrine of moral diplomacy seeking to make the world safe for democracy. Some of his activities at the time can be viewed as imperialism to stop the advance of democracy in countries such as Haiti. The United States invaded Haiti in July 1915 after having made landfall eight times previously. American rule in Haiti continued through 1942, but was initiated during World War I. The historian Mary Renda in her book, Taking Haiti, talks about the American invasion of Haiti to bring about political stability through U.S. control. The American government did not believe Haiti was ready for self-government or democracy, according to Renda. In order to bring about political stability in Haiti, the United States secured control and integrated the country into the international capitalist economy, while preventing Haiti from practicing self-governance or democracy. While Haiti had been running their own government for many years before American intervention, the U.S. government regarded Haiti as unfit for self-rule. In order to convince the American public of the justice in intervening, the United States government used paternalist propaganda, depicting the Haitian political process as uncivilized. The Haitian government would come to agree to U.S. terms, including American overseeing of the Haitian economy. This direct supervision of the Haitian economy would reinforce U.S. propaganda and further entrench the perception of Haitians being incompetent of self governance. In World War I, the U.S., Britain, and Russia had been allies for seven months, from April 1917 until the Bolsheviks seized power in Russia in November. Active distrust surfaced immediately, as even before the October Revolution, British officers had been involved in the Kornilov affair, which sought to crush the Russian anti war movement and the independent Soviets. Nonetheless, once the Bolsheviks took Moscow, the British began talks to try and keep them in the war effort. British diplomat Bruce Lockhart cultivated a relationship with several Soviet officials, including Leon Trotsky, and the latter approved the initial Allied military mission to secure the Eastern Front, which was collapsing in the revolutionary upheaval. Ultimately, Soviet head of state V.I. Lenin decided the Bolsheviks would settle peacefully with the Central Powers at the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. This separate peace led to Allied disdain for the Soviets, since it left the Western Allies to fight Germany without a strong Eastern partner. 
The British CIS, supported by U.S. diplomat DeWitt C. Poole, sponsored an attempted coup in Moscow involving Bruce Lockhart and Sidney Riley, which involved an attempted assassination of Lenin. The Bolsheviks proceeded to shut down the British and U.S. embassies. Tensions between Russia including its allies and the West turned intensely ideological. Horrified by mass executions of white forces, land expropriations, and widespread repression, the Allied military expedition now assisted the anti-Bolshevik whites in the Russian Civil War, with the British and French giving armed support to the brutal General Alexander Kolchak. Over 30,000 Western troops were deployed in Russia overall. This was the first event which made Russian-American relations a matter of major, long-term concern to the leaders in each country. Some historians, including William Appleman Williams and Ronald Pawaski, trace the origins of the Cold War to this conflict. Wilson launched seven armed interventions, more than any other president. Looking back on the Wilson era, General Smedley Darlington Butler, a leader of the Haiti expedition and the highest decorated Marine of that time, considered virtually all of the operations to have been economically motivated. In a 1933 speech he said, I was a racketeer, a gangster for capitalism. I suspected I was just part of a racket at the time. Now I am sure of it. I helped make Mexico, especially Tampico, safe for American oil interests in 1914. I helped make Haiti and Cuba a decent place for the National City Bank boys to collect revenues in. I helped in the raping of half a dozen Central American republics for the benefits of Wall Street. Looking back on it, I feel that I could have given Al Capone a few hints. The best he could do was to operate his racket in three districts. I operated on three continents. Topic. Views of American imperialism Journalist Ashley Smith divides theories of the U.S. imperialism into five broad categories, one, liberal, theories, two, social democratic, theories, three, Leninist, theories, four, theories of super-imperialism, and five, heart and negri theories. There is also a conservative, anti-interventionist view as expressed by American journalist John T. Flynn. The enemy aggressor is always pursuing a course of larceny, murder, rapine and barbarism. We are always moving forward with high mission, a destiny imposed by the deity to regenerate our victims, while incidentally capturing their markets, to civilize savage and senile and paranoid peoples, while blundering accidentally into their oil wells. A. Social Democratic Theory says that imperialistic U.S. policies are the products of the excessive influence of certain sectors of U.S. business and government. The arms industry in alliance with military and political bureaucracies and sometimes other industries such as oil and finance, a combination often referred to as the military-industrial complex. The complex is said to benefit from war profiteering and the looting of natural resources, often at the expense of the public interest. The proposed solution is typically unceasing popular vigilance in order to apply counter-pressure. Chalmers Johnson holds a version of this view. Alfred Thayer Mahon, who served as an officer in the U.S. Navy during the late 19th century, supported the notion of American imperialism in his 1890 book titled The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. Mahon argued that modern industrial nations must secure foreign markets for the purpose of exchanging goods and, consequently, they must maintain a maritime force that is capable of protecting these trade routes, a theory of super imperialism argues that imperialistic U.S. policies are not driven solely by the interests of American businesses, but also by the interests of a larger apparatus of a global alliance among the economic elite in developed countries. The argument asserts that capitalism in the global north Europe, the U.S., Japan, among others has become too entangled to permit military or geopolitical conflict between these countries, and the central conflict in modern imperialism is between the global north also referred to as the global core and the global south also referred to as the global periphery rather than between the imperialist powers. Topic. Empire Following the invasion of Afghanistan in 2001, the idea of American imperialism was re-examined. In November 2001, jubilant Marines hoisted an American flag over Kandahar and in a stage display referred to the moment as the third after those on San Juan Hill and Iwo Jima. All moments, writes Neil Smith, express U.S. global ambition. 
Labeled a war on terrorism, the new war represents an unprecedented quickening of the American empire, a third chance at global power. On October 15, the cover of William Crystal's Weekly Standard carried the headline, The Case for American Empire. Rich Lowry, editor in chief of the National Review, called for, A kind of low grade colonialism, to topple dangerous regimes beyond Afghanistan. The columnist Charles Krauthammer declared that, given complete U.S. domination, culturally, economically, technologically, and militarily, people were now coming out of the closet on the word empire. The New York Times Sunday Magazine cover for January 5, 2003, read, American Empire, get used to it. The phrase, American Empire, appeared more than 1,000 times in news stories during November 2002 to April 2003. Two Harvard historians and their French colleague observed, Since September 11, 2001, if not earlier, the idea of American empire is back. Now, for the first time since the early 20th century, it has become acceptable to ask whether the United States has become or is becoming an empire in some classic sense. It used to be that only the critics of American foreign policy referred to the American empire. In the past three or four years 2001 to 2004, however, a growing number of commentators have begun to use the term American empire less pejoratively, if still ambivalently, and in some cases with genuine enthusiasm. U.S. historians have generally considered the late 19th century imperialist urge as an aberration in an otherwise smooth democratic trajectory. Yet a century later, as the U.S. empire engages in a new period of global expansion, Rome is once more a distant but essential mirror for American elites. Now, with military mobilization on an exceptional scale after September 2001, the United States is openly affirming and parading its imperial power. For the first time since the 1890s, the naked display of force is backed by explicitly imperialist discourse. In the book, Empire. Michael Hart and Antonio Negri argue that the decline of empire has begun. Hart says the Iraq War is a classically imperialist war, and is the last gasp of a doomed strategy. They expand on this, claiming that in the new era of imperialism, the classical imperialists retain a colonizing power of sorts, but the strategy shifts from military occupation of economies based on physical goods to a networked biopower based on an informational and effective economies. They go on to say that the U.S. is central to the development of this new regime of international power and sovereignty, termed empire, but that it is decentralized and global, and not ruled by one sovereign state. The United States does indeed occupy a privileged position in empire, but this privilege derives not from its similarities to the old European imperialist powers, but from its differences. Hart and Negri draw on the theories of Spinoza, Foucault, Deleuze and Italian autonomist Marxists. Geographer David Harvey says there has emerged a new type of imperialism due to geographical distinctions as well as unequal rates of development. He says there has emerged three new global economic and political blocs, the United States, the European Union and Asia centered on China and Russia. He says there are tensions between the three major blocs over resources and economic power, citing the 2003 invasion of Iraq, the motive of which, he argues, was to prevent rival blocs from controlling oil. Furthermore, Harvey argues that there can arise conflict within the major blocs between business interests and the politicians due to their sometimes incongruent economic interests. Politicians live in geographically fixed locations and are, in the US and Europe, accountable to an electorate. The new imperialism, then, has led to an alignment of the interests of capitalists and politicians in order to prevent the rise and expansion of possible economic and political rivals from challenging America's dominance. Classics professor and war historian Victor Davis Hanson dismisses the notion of an American empire altogether, with a mocking comparison to historical empires. We do not send out proconsuls to reside over client states, which in turn impose taxes on coerced subjects to pay for the legions. Instead, American bases are predicated on contractual obligations—costly to us and profitable to their hosts. We do not see any profits in Korea, but instead accept the risk of losing almost 40,000 of our youth to ensure that Kias can flood our shores and that shaggy students can protest outside our embassy in Seoul. The existence of proconsuls 
however, has been recognized by many since the early Cold War. In 1957, French historian, Amory de Rancourt, associated the American proconsul with the Roman of our time. Expert on recent American history, Arthur M. Schlesinger detected several contemporary imperial features, including proconsuls. Washington does not directly run many parts of the world. Rather, its informal empire was one richly equipped with imperial paraphernalia, troops, ships, planes, bases, proconsuls, local collaborators, all spread wide around the luckless planet. The Supreme Allied Commander, always an American, was an appropriate title for the American proconsul whose reputation and influence outweighed those of European premiers, presidents, and chancellors. U.S. combatant commanders have served as its proconsuls. Their standing in their regions has usually dwarfed that of ambassadors and assistant secretaries of state." Harvard historian Niall Ferguson calls the regional combatant commanders, among whom the whole globe is divided, the proconsuls of this imperium. Gunter Bischoff calls them the all-powerful proconsuls of the new American empire. Like the proconsuls of Rome they were supposed to bring order and law to the unruly and anarchical world. In September 2000, Washington Post reporter Dana Priest published a series of articles whose central premise was combatant commanders' inordinate amount of political influence within the countries in their areas of responsibility. They had evolved into the modern-day equivalent of the Roman Empire's proconsuls, well-funded, semi-autonomous, unconventional centers of U.S. foreign policy. The Romans often preferred to exercise power through friendly client regimes, rather than direct rule. Until J. Garner and L. Paul Bremer became U.S. proconsuls in Baghdad, that was the American method too. Another distinction of Victor Davis Hansen that U.S. bases, contrary to the legions, are costly to America and profitable for their hosts expresses the American view. The hosts express a diametrically opposite view. Japan pays for 25,000 Japanese working on U.S. bases. 20% of those workers provide entertainment. A list drawn up by the Japanese Ministry of Defense included 76 bartenders, 48 vending machine personnel, 47 golf course maintenance personnel, 25 club managers, 20 commercial artists, 9 leisure boat operators, 6 theater directors, 5 cake decorators, 4 bowling alley clerks, 3 tour guides, and 1 animal caretaker. Shu Watanabe of the Democratic Party of Japan asks, Why does Japan need to pay the costs for U.S. service members' entertainment on their holidays? One research on host nations' support concludes, at an alliance-level analysis, case studies of South Korea and Japan present that the necessity of the alliance relationship with the U.S. and their relative capabilities to achieve security purposes lead them to increase the size of direct economic investment to support the U.S. forces stationed in their territories, as well as to facilitate the U.S. global defense posture. In addition, these two countries have increased their political and economic contribution to the U.S.-led military operations beyond the geographic scope of the alliance in the post-Cold War period. Behavioral changes among the U.S. allies in response to demands for sharing alliance burdens directly indicate the changed nature of unipolar alliances. In order to maintain its power preponderance and primacy, the Unipol has imposed greater pressure on its allies to devote much of their resources and energy to contributing to its global defense posture. It is expected that the systemic properties of unipolarity non-structural threat and a power preponderance of the Unipol gradually increase the political and economic burdens of the allies in need of maintaining alliance relationships with the Unipol. In fact, increasing the economic burdens of the allies is one of the major priorities of President Donald Trump. Classicist Eric Adler notes that Hansen earlier had written about the decline of the classical studies in the United States and insufficient attention devoted to the classical experience. When writing about American foreign policy for a lay audience, however, Hansen himself chose to castigate Roman imperialism in order to portray the modern United States as different from—and superior to—the Roman state. As a supporter of a hawkish unilateral American foreign policy, Hansen's 
distinctly negative view of Roman imperialism is particularly noteworthy, since it demonstrates the importance a contemporary supporter of a hawkish American foreign policy places on criticizing Rome. U.S. foreign policy debate Annexation is a crucial instrument in the expansion of a nation, due to the fact that once a territory is annexed it must act within the confines of its superior counterpart. The United States Congress's ability to annex a foreign territory is explained in a report from the Congressional Committee on Foreign Relations. If, in the judgment of Congress, such a measure is supported by a safe and wise policy, or is based upon a natural duty that we owe to the people of Hawaii, or is necessary for our national development and security, that is enough to justify annexation, with the consent of the recognized government of the country to be annexed." Prior to annexing a territory, the American government still held immense power through the various legislations passed in the late 1800s. The Platt Amendment was utilized to prevent Cuba from entering into any agreements with foreign nations, and also granted the Americans the right to build naval stations on their soil. Executive officials in the American government began to determine themselves the supreme authority in matters regarding the recognition or restriction of independence, when asked on April 28, 2003, on Al Jazeera whether the United States was empire building. Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld replied. We don't seek empires, we're not imperialistic. We never have been. However, historian Donald W. Maynig says the imperial behavior by the United States dates at least to the Louisiana Purchase, which he describes as an imperial acquisition imperial in the sense of the aggressive encroachment of one people upon the territory of another, resulting in the subjugation of that people to alien rule. The U.S. policies towards the Native Americans he said were designed to remold them into a people more appropriately conformed to imperial desires." Writers and academics of the early 20th century, like Charles A. Beard, in support of non-interventionism sometimes referred to as isolationism, discussed American policy as being driven by self-interested expansionism going back as far as the writing of the Constitution. Some politicians today do not agree. Pat Buchanan claims that the modern United States drive to empire is far removed from what the Founding Fathers had intended the Young Republic to become." Andrew Basevich argues that the U.S. did not fundamentally change its foreign policy after the Cold War, and remains focused on an effort to expand its control across the world. As the surviving superpower at the end of the Cold War, the U.S. could focus its assets in new directions, the future being, "...up for grabs." According to former Under Secretary of Defense for Policy Paul Wolfowitz in 1991, Head of the Olin Institute for Strategic Studies at Harvard University, Stephen Peter Rosen, maintains A political unit that has overwhelming superiority in military power, and uses that power to influence the internal behavior of other states, is called an empire. Because the United States does not seek to control territory or govern the overseas citizens of the empire, we are an indirect empire, to be sure, but an empire nonetheless. If this is correct, our goal is not combating a rival, but maintaining our imperial position, and maintaining imperial order. In Manufacturing Consent, the Political Economy of the Mass Media, the political activist Noam Chomsky argues that exceptionalism and the denials of imperialism are the result of a systematic strategy of propaganda, to manufacture opinion. As the process has long been described in other countries, Thornton wrote that, Imperialism is more often the name of the emotion that reacts to a series of events than a definition of the events themselves. Where colonization finds analysts and analogies, imperialism must contend with crusaders for and against. Political theorist Michael Walzer argues that the term hegemony is better than empire to describe the U.S.'s role in the world. Political scientist Robert Keohane agrees, saying, A balanced and nuanced analysis is not aided by the use of the phrase empire to describe United States hegemony, since empire obscures rather than illuminates the differences in form of rule between the United States and other great powers, such as Great Britain in the 19th century or the Soviet Union in the 20th. Since 2001, Emmanuel Todd assumes that USA cannot hold for long the status of Mondial hegemonic power due to limited resources. 
Instead, the USA is going to become just one of the major regional powers along with European Union, China, Russia, etc. Reviewing Todd's After the Empire, G. John Eikenberry found that it had been written in a fit of French wishful thinking. The thinking proved to be Wishful indeed, as the book became a bestseller in France for most of the year 2003, other political scientists, such as Daniel Nexon and Thomas Wright, argue that neither term exclusively describes foreign relations of the United States. The U.S. can be, and has been, simultaneously an empire and a hegemonic power. They claim that the general trend in U.S. foreign relations has been away from imperial modes of control. Cultural imperialism Some critics of imperialism argue that military and cultural imperialism are interdependent. American Edward Said, one of the founders of post-colonial theory, said that So influential has been the discourse insisting on American specialness, altruism and opportunity, that imperialism in the United States as a word or ideology has turned up only rarely and recently in accounts of the United States culture, politics and history. But the connection between imperial politics and culture in North America, and in particular in the United States, is astonishingly direct. International relations scholar David Rothkopf disagrees and argues that cultural imperialism is the innocent result of globalization, which allows access to numerous U.S. and Western ideas and products that many non-U.S. and non-Western consumers across the world voluntarily choose to consume. Matthew Fraser has a similar analysis, but argues further that the global cultural influence of the U.S. is a good thing. Nationalism is the main process through which the government is able to shape public opinion. Propaganda in the media is strategically placed in order to promote a common attitude among the people. Louis A. Perez Jr. provides an example of propaganda used during the War of 1898. We are coming, Cuba, coming, we are bound to set you free. We are coming from the mountains, from the plains and inland sea. We are coming with the wrath of God to make the Spaniards flee. We are coming, Cuba, coming, coming now. American progressives have been accused of engaging in cultural imperialism. In contrast, many other countries with American brands have incorporated themselves into their own local culture. An example of this would be the self-styled Maccas, an Australian derivation of McDonald's, with a tinge of Australian culture. U.S. <laughs> military bases Chalmers Johnson argued in 2004 that America's version of the colony is the military base. Chip Pitts argued similarly in 2006 that enduring U.S. bases in Iraq suggested a vision of Iraq as a colony, while territories such as Guam, the United States Virgin Islands, the Northern Mariana Islands, American Samoa and Puerto Rico remain under U.S. control. The U.S. allowed many of its overseas territories or occupations to gain independence after World War II. Examples include the Philippines 1946, the Panama Canal Zone 1979, Palau 1981, the Federated States of Micronesia 1986, and the Marshall Islands 1986. Most of them still have U.S. bases within their territories. In the case of Okinawa, which came under U.S. administration after the Battle of Okinawa during the Second World War, this happened despite local popular opinion. In 2003, a Department of Defense distribution found the United States had bases in over 36 countries worldwide. By 1970, the United States had more than 1 million soldiers in 30 countries, was a member of four regional defense alliances and an active participant in a fifth, had mutual defense treaties with 42 nations, was a member of 53 international organizations, and was furnishing military or economic aid to nearly 100 nations across the face of the globe. In 2015 the Department of Defense reported the number of bases that had any military or civilians stationed or employed was 587. This includes land only where no facilities are present, facility or facilities only where there the underlying land is neither owned nor controlled by the government, and land with facilities where both are present. Also in 2015, David Vine's book Base Nation, found 800 U.S. military bases located outside of the U.S., including 174 bases in Germany, 113 in Japan, and 83 in South Korea, the total costs, an estimated $100 billion a year. 
Topic: <inaudible> Benevolent Imperialism. One of the earliest historians of American empire, William Appleman Williams, wrote: "The routine lust for land, markets or security became justifications for noble rhetoric about prosperity, liberty and security." Max Boot defends U.S. imperialism by claiming, "...U.S. imperialism has been the greatest force for good in the world during the past century. It has defeated communism and Nazism and has intervened against the Taliban and Serbian ethnic cleansing." Boot used, "...imperialism," to describe United States policy, not only in the early 20th century but, "...since at least 1803." This embrace of empire is made by other neoconservatives, including British historian Paul Johnson, and writers Dinesh D'Souza and Mark Stain. It is also made by some liberal hawks, such as political scientist Zbigniew Brzezinski and Michael Ignatieff. British historian Niall Ferguson argues that the United States is an empire and believes that this is a good thing. What is not allowed is to say that the United States is an empire and that this might not be wholly bad. Ferguson has drawn parallels between the British Empire and the imperial role of the United States in the late 20th and early 21st centuries, though he describes the United States political and social structures as more like those of the Roman Empire than of the British. Ferguson argues that all of these empires have had both positive and negative aspects, but that the positive aspects of the U.S. empire will, if it learns from history and its mistakes, greatly outweigh its negative aspects. Another point of view implies that United States expansion overseas has indeed been imperialistic, but that this imperialism is only a temporary phenomenon, a corruption of American ideals or the relic of a past historical era. Historian Samuel Flagg Bemis argues that Spanish-American war expansionism was a short-lived imperialistic impulse and a great aberration in American history, a very different form of territorial growth than that of earlier American history. Historian Walter Leifber sees the Spanish-American war expansionism not as an aberration, but as a culmination of United States expansion westward. Historian Victor Davis Hansen argues that the U.S does not pursue world domination, but maintains worldwide influence by a system of mutually beneficial exchanges. On the other hand, a Filipino revolutionary general Emilio Aguinaldo felt as though the American involvement in the Philippines was destructive. The Filipinos fighting for liberty, the American people fighting them to give them liberty. The two peoples are fighting on parallel lines for the same object. American influence worldwide and the effects it has on other nations have multiple interpretations according to whose perspective is being taken into account. Liberal internationalists argue that even though the present world order is dominated by the United States, the form taken by that dominance is not imperial. International relations scholar John Eikenberry argues that international institutions have taken the place of empire. International relations scholar Joseph Nye argues that U.S. power is more and more based on soft power," which comes from cultural hegemony rather than raw military or economic force. This includes such factors as the widespread desire to emigrate to the United States, the prestige and corresponding high proportion of foreign students at U.S. universities, and the spread of U.S. styles of popular music and cinema. Mass immigration into America may justify this theory, but it is hard to know for sure whether the United States would still maintain its prestige without its military and economic superiority. Topic. See also Topic. Notes and references Topic. Further reading Basevich, Andrew The Limits of Power, The End of American Exceptionalism. Macmillan. ISBN 0-8050-8815-6. Boot, Max the Savage Wars of Peace, Small Wars and the Rise of American Power. Basic Books. ISBN 0-465-00721-X. Brown, Sayom Faces of Power, Constancy and Change in United States Foreign Policy from Truman to Clinton. New York, Columbia University Press. ISBN 0-231-09669-0. Burton, David H. 1968. Theodore Roosevelt, Confident Imperialist. Philadelphia, University of Pennsylvania Press. 
ASINB0007GMSSY. Callahan, Patrick. 2003. Logics of American Foreign Policy: Theories of America's World Role. New York: Longman. ISBN 0-321-08848-4. Card, Orson Scott. 2006. Empire. Tour. ISBN 0-7653-1611-0. Dalder, Evo H., James M. Lindsay 2003. America Unbound, The Bush Revolution in Foreign Policy. Washington, D.C., Brookings Institution. ISBN 0-8157-1688-5. Fulbright, J. William, Seth P. Tillman 1989. The Price of Empire. Pantheon Books. ISBN 0-394-57224-6. Gaddis, John Lewis 2005. Strategies of Containment, A Critical Appraisal of Postwar American National Security Policy 2nd ed. New York, Oxford University Press. ISBN 0-19517447-X. Grandin, Greg. The Death Cult of Trumpism, in his appeals to a racist and nationalist chauvinism, Trump leverages tribal resentment against an emerging manifest common destiny. The Nation, the 29th of January, the 5th of February 2018, pp. 20 to 22. T. He ongoing effects of the ruinous 2003 war in Iraq and the 2007 to 8 financial meltdown are two indicators that the promise of endless growth can no longer help organize people's aspirations. We are entering the second lost decade of what Larry Summers calls secular stagnation, and soon we'll be in the third decade of a war that Senator Lindsey Graham says will never end. T. Here is a realization that the world is fragile and that we are trapped in an economic system that is well past sustainable or justifiable. In a nation like the United States, founded on a mythical belief in a kind of species immunity, less an American exceptionalism than exemptionism, an insistence that the nation was exempt from nature, society, history, even death, the realization that it can't go on forever is traumatic. p. 21. Hart, Michael, Antonio Negri 2001. Empire. Cambridge, Massachusetts, Harvard University Press. ISBN 0-674-00671-2, Online Huntington, Samuel P. 1996. The Clash of Civilizations. New York, Simon & Schuster. ISBN 0-684-81164-2. Johnson, Chalmers 2000. Blowback, The Costs and Consequences of American Empire. New York, Holt. ISBN 0-8050-6239-4. Johnson, Chalmers 2004. The Sorrows of Empire, Militarism, Secrecy, and the End of the Republic. New York, Metropolitan Books. ISBN 0-8050-7004-4. Johnson, Chalmers 2007. Nemesis, The Last Days of the American Republic. New York, New York, Metropolitan Books. ISBN 0-8050-7911-4. Kagan, Robert 2003. Of Paradise and Power, America and Europe in the New World Order. New York, Knopf. ISBN 1-4000-4093-0. Carey, Richard J. 1990. The Star-Spangled Mirror, America's Image of Itself and the World. Savage, M.D., Roman and Littlefield. ISBN 0-8476-7649-8. Lundestad, Gare. Empire by Integration, The United States and European Integration, 1945-1997. New York, Oxford University Press. ISBN 0-19-878212-8. Meyer, William H. 2003. Security, Economics, and Morality in American Foreign Policy, Contemporary Issues in Historical Context. Upper Saddle River, N.J., Prentice Hall. ISBN 0-13-086390-4. Nye, Joseph S., Jr. 2002. The Paradox of American Power, Why the World's Only Superpower Can't Go It Alone. New York, Oxford University Press. ISBN 0-19-515088-0. Odom, William, Robert Duharic 2004. America's Inadvertent Empire. Yale University Press. ISBN 0-300-10069-8.
Patrick, Stewart, Foreman, Shepard, eds. 2001. Multilateralism and U.S. Foreign Policy, Ambivalent Engagement. Boulder, Colorado, Lynn Reiner. ISBN 1-58826-042-9. Perkins, John Confessions of an Economic Hit Man. Tiran, Nasher I. Akhtaran. ISBN 1-57675-301-8. Rapkin, David P., ed. 1990. World Leadership and Hegemony. Boulder, Colorado, Lynn Reiner. ISBN 1-55587-189-5. Ruggie, John G., ed. 1993. Multilateralism Matters, The Theory and Praxis of an Institutional Form. New York, Columbia University Press. ISBN 978-0-231-07980-8. Smith, Tony America's Mission, The United States and the Worldwide Struggle for Democracy in the Twentieth Century. Princeton, N.J., Princeton University Press. ISBN 0-691-03784-1. Tomlinson, John Cultural Imperialism, A Critical Introduction. Baltimore, Maryland, Johns Hopkins University Press. ISBN 0-8018-4250-6. Todd, Emanuel After the Empire, The Breakdown of the American Order. New York, Columbia University Press. ISBN 978-0-231-13103-2. Tremblay, Rodrigue The New American Empire. Haverford, PA, Infinity Pub. ISBN 0-7414-1887-8. Zepazauer, Mark 2002. Boomerang, How Our Covert Wars Have Created Enemies Across the Middle East and Brought Terror to America. Monroe, Maine, Common Courage Press. ISBN 1-56751-222-4. External links Imperial America by Richard Haas, 2000, Empire or Not? A Quiet Debate Over U.S. Role by Thomas E. Ricks, 2001 The Answer to Terrorism? Colonialism by Paul Johnson, 2001 The Need for a New Imperialism by Martin Wolf, 2001 The Case for American Empire by Max Boot, 2001 All Roads Lead to D.C. by Emily Eakin, 2002 The Reluctant Imperialist, Terrorism, Failed States, and the Case for American Empire by Sebastian Malaby, 2002. The New Liberal Imperialism. By Robert Cooper, 2002. In Praise of American Empire. By Dinesh D'Souza, 2002. Empire Light. By Michael Ignatieff, 2003. America and the Tragic Limits of Imperialism. By Robert D. Kaplan, 2003. An Empire in Denial, The Limits of U.S. Imperialism", by Niall Ferguson, 2003. In Defense of Empires", by Deepak Lal, 2003.